All right, so we made our first input file. Um, we ran it in Astron, and now we need to look at the results. So again, I, I always want to stress in this class that um, when you do a problem, you need to validate it somehow. Uh, the problems in this class are simple enough that almost all of them have exact solutions. So here is just the mechanics of materials type of solution for this problem. So it's just a statically indeterminate problem. So we have um, reaction forces at A and B. They sum to equal the five kip force. Uh, but it's statically indeterminate. You have two unknowns, one equation of equilibrium. Uh, so you have to use the supplemental compatibility equation that the total elongation of this uh, specimen is zero. So here's the elongation of the first uh, part, and then here's the elongation of the second section. The sum of the two of those has to go to zero. That gives you this relationship in terms of the reaction forces. allows us to solve for the reaction forces. And then once you know the reaction forces, you can go get the internal forces and then the or the stresses in each one of those sections. So here's this a compressional 15 KSI stress in this one and an extensional 10 KSI stress in this element. Then we can get the displacements of the nodes. Obviously these nodes displace zero, but this node displaces uh, seven thousandths of an inch to the left. And then we can get this strains. And here are the, the strains in the elements. So these are going to correspond to the stresses and the strains in the elements. We'll be able to get the reaction forces from the SPC reactions. We'll be able to compare those. And of course, we can compare the nodal displacements. So we can check all those against our final element results. Okay? Okay. Uh, let's go back to the slides and let's show you the output files. So let's talk a little bit about output files. So in NASTRAN, you have several output files. And depending upon what output sections you put in your uh, load case, you might get some different ones. The main one we're going to consider in this class is the .fo6. It's an ASCII file, and it outputs the data, the results. Um, typically, uh, you got these little log file that tells you what's being executed. The FO4 gives you ideas about how much memory is being used in the solution. Sometimes you write what are so-called punch files. We might talk about that. Th those can be read by Hypermesh. They're also ASCII file or text files, so Hypermesh likes to read those. Um, if you have lots of, if you have lots of elements, millions of elements, these files can become really large. And in fact, a better format to um, output uh, are binary files. They don't take up nearly as much space as an ASCII file. So the OPT OP2 file is NASTRAN's binary output file. But in this class, we won't, we won't have anything any more than, you know, maybe 100 elements top. So the ASCII files are fine. Okay, the FO6 is the main file we're going to look at. You can open this up in a text editor like Notepad again. It's an ASCII file. It's uh, in sections. Actually, those sections are called pages. Why don't we open it up now, actually, just to look at it so you can see what it looks like. So here's the FO6, and I think if I double-click on it, it'll open right up. All right, so here's my FO6 file. Uh, it's, again, text. Uh, the pages are kind of denoted here. You can see on the right side, you've got page one, two, three, so on and so forth. Uh, so let's talk about the format of this. Here results, so on and so forth. Uh, so if you get it to run, open up this file and you can follow along with what's going on here. The first page is like 120 lines, and that's just a bunch of NASTRAN PR. Uh, you can ignore that. Page 2 spits out some of the comments that you put in up top. Uh, the third page gives you the executive case summary that tells you what solvers you use. In this case, it'll be Solver 101. Again, that's really not of much use for the most part. The fourth page gives you the load case summary. Again, that's not bad to look at, just to make sure that it's running the load cases you think it's running. Uh, page five gives you modely, model summary stuff like number of nodes, number of elements, number of loads, so on and so forth. Uh, pages six through nine 
give you a summary of how the solution went. We won't talk too much about this, but one of the big things that introduce error into finite element problems are so-called matrix conditioning issues. And if your matrix is poorly conditioned, maybe you have inappropriate boundary conditions or highly distorted elements, they're going to result in element conditioning problems. And if the conditioning is really poor, it will not solve or it'll give you errors in the solve. So looking at 9 through 6 will give an indication of how good the linear solve was and if you have any conditioning problems. Yeah, we'll talk about a little bit of that in Chapter 5, I believe. But really, uh, you know, that's um, summary stuff. So after those, we get to the results. So here we start with page 10. This is the output from page 10. This gives you the displacement results. Here you can see the displacements. Um, uh, this is the actual output from our .fo6 file for this run. For each grid point to find, it gives you the nodal displacements and the nodal rotations. So T1, 2, and 3, those columns are the translations in the X, Y, and Z direction. And then R1, 2, and 3 are the rotations about the X, Y, and Z axes. And again, if you specified another coordinate system, CID, for that particular grid point, it will resolve these displacements in that coordinate system. If you leave that blank, it's going to use global, and these are the in the global X, Y, Z axes. Okay. If you have multiple load cases, there will be different displacements typically for each load case, and so it'll have the displacement for each load case or subcase listed separately. Here we just have one subcase, so you can see it just shows the displacements for the three nodes for the one subcase. Okay, so here you can look at the displacements. All right. In fact, here you can see all the displacements are zero, except for the x displacement at node two, and it's minus. 0.00737 units. And that actually corresponds directly to the exact solution. If we go back to the exact solution. Where's the exact solution? Here's the exact solution. You can see the displacement is minus 0 0.00763 inches. Okay? So this is why you want, you want to check those values. All the other displacements are zero. Okay. The next section gives you the SPC constraint data. So these are the reaction forces. So obviously if you have a constraint, say we're fixed at the ends, there are reaction forces that enforce that constraint. Those are the reaction forces R and B that we solve for in the exact solution, okay? You can also have reaction moments, okay? So it's built in. So you've constrained six degrees of freedom, so you can have reactions, forces and moments about those six degrees of freedom. So here we've constrained two nodes, one and three, and here it's giving you the reaction forces. Okay, you can see the moments are all zero. The only non-zero reaction forces are in the x direction, and this says that we have a uh, three point six kip force at node 1, and then a 1.3 kip force at node 2 in the x direction. And that also corresponds to the exact solution. Let's go back to the other solution. This is posted on uh, Blackboard as well. You can see here the reaction forces. 3.68 and 1.31. Okay. 3.68, 1.31. So it matches exactly. All right. Next section, this is page 12, gives you the element strains, because um, we asked it to write it out. If you leave that element strain section, you know, if you leave this part here where it says strain von Mises equals all, you know, then it, it won't write out the strain data, but, but we, we're going to ask for that, so it gives you the strain data. Uh, the form of the element strains depends upon the elements being used, whether it's a C-rod, C-bar, C-hexa, or C-tri, or whatever. Um, because the elements are formed differently, they can support different types of, of, of strain components. Uh, for a bar element, you have axial and torsional strain. 
that's the only thing it can support. It can't support bending. So either it has the stretching strain, you know, like you're pulling on the rod, and then the torsional, like you're twisting it. All right. So these are going to be resolved in the local element coordinate system. So when it says axial strain, that's the actual strain uh, in element one down its axis. And you can see here, uh, for element one, that's the first sort of column, it has a compressional strain of 1.7 KSI and a torsional strain of zero. All right? If in your material card you specify a yield, it can give you a safe, safety margin. But we didn't do that, so it leaves this safety margin. It's like a factor of safety at zero. And then you can see in the next, the right half side, we, we have uh, the stress, the strains for element two. It's a tensile, tensile strain of uh, normal strain of uh, one times ten to the minus third. Okay? And again, those correspond pretty close to the exact solution. Then we also have the stresses in the FO6 file. And this basically has the same form as the element strains. It's just obviously the stresses. Okay? You get axial stress, torsional stress. The axial stress in the first element is minus 1.47 KSI. And then it's tension in the second element, 1.052. And again, you can see that that corresponds to the exact solution here, right? 14 KSI and 10 KSI, right? All right, 10 to the fourth, 14, minus 14 KSI, 10 KSI. Um, and again, also with the strains, if you have multiple subcases or load cases, it'll write the element stresses for each load case. Okay? Well, that's pretty much it. So that shows the results. I suggest that you actually go through this stuff yourself. Uh, try to write the input file by hand. I mean, I posted the input file online, but, you know, um, you can use that as a reference, but I suggest that you actually write your own input file so you get used to the formatting and making sure that all the values sit in the right field widths. Uh, run it. Get Look at your .fo6 file. Make sure that the values correspond to the values here or the exact solution, okay? You can use my exact solution if you want, but look through it. That's fine. Uh, for your homeworks, when you do computational problems, you will always have to justify your final results somehow, either by solving the exact solution by hand or, or maybe a bound type of thing or looking at convergence or some way of showing that the results are reasonable, okay? Okay. Uh, well, that's pretty much it. Again, uh, also, I, I recommend looking through the NASTRAN file. What I mean, this NASTRAN reference manual, the Linear Static User's Guide. Whenever you go to start doing these homeworks and developing these NASTRAN files, always have this open. It's a big help. Especially, we'll be looking mostly at you know the NASTRAN element section, and then the you know that that's where we'll, you'll be most of the time. If you're doing 2D elements, you might look at the C quad four elements and the C tri three elements. And look at the sections here, okay? And you can see these are actually the forms of the inputs, all right? Okay, uh, that's pretty much it then. Well, good luck, and I guess the last thing I should say is don't get frustrated. It is a little tedious at first, but I find that it's the most important skill you learn out of this class really is the ability to be able to look at a text, find an element input file, be able to directly deal with what's being done in your finite element model as opposed to having uh, a, fine, a graphical preprocessor kind of interpret what you want done and not being sure exactly what's being solved is what you want to be solved. Okay? Okay, thanks.